praise him. There's a spirit of excitement in this place, expectation. Hallelujah. You are worthy, God. You are holy. You are high and lifted up, Jesus. Holy, 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 holy. Come on, let's join with the angels and sing holy. Holy are you, God. You are mighty in this place. You are mighty, God. Yes, Jesus, you are a healer, a deliverer. Hallelujah, we come to praise you. That's what we've come to do this morning. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's continue to worship this morning. Did you come to praise him? Woo, we love you, Jesus. We feel your presence in this place. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Say, I come. I come to praise you. I come to lift you up.
you, Jesus. Ooh. Come on, there's nobody like him this morning. He's been so good. We've come to lift you up, Jesus. No matter what comes our way, we will trust in you, Jesus. Yes. See? Hallelujah.
bless the Lord this morning. <laughs> How many know that our God is greater? Our God is healer. Our God is strong in power. begin to 
lift up a cry of praise to God. Our God's greater. Our God's greater. Our God's greater. Our God's greater. Oh, come on. We're going to begin to just war cry in this place today. We know our God's a healer. We know our God's a deliverer. We know that he's all these things and more. So we're crying out to him this morning. We're crying out to the God that we know as healer. Come on. Don't stop worshiping him. Don't stop going after him this morning. Come on, just forget about everything and just go after him this morning. Open up your mouth to begin to pray in the spirit if you need to. Oh, we love you, Lord. Oh, we're crying out, we're crying out, we're crying out to you, Jesus. Crying out to you, Lord.
I want you to begin to summon the warrior that's in here. I'm talking about the warrior for some of you that has been hidden and has yearned to come forth. There's a warrior inside of you that's desiring to fight, that's wanting to get out. There's a war cry in this house this morning. Maybe you're okay, maybe you're good, but there's people in front of you, behind you, beside you that need somebody to stand in the gap this morning and let the warrior cry out. Will you do that? Somebody say yes in this house.
fresh wind blowing on us. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. Fresh wind blow, fresh wind blow, fresh wind. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. Fresh wind blow, fresh wind blow, fresh wind blow. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. There's a fresh wind. There's a fresh wind blowing on us, fresh wind blow, fresh wind blow, fresh wind blow. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. Ah There's a fresh wind blowing on us. There's a fresh wind blowing on us, fresh wind blow, fresh wind blow, fresh wind blow. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. There's a fresh wind blowing on us. There's a fresh wind blowing on us, fresh wind. Are, the most, are, are some of those important 
aspects of our lives at this point where we are in this, in this journey we are with God. We need encounter after encounter after encounter after encounter. And the problem we face often is we allow the one encounter that we had so far in the past to be that that sustains us for far too long. And the agenda of God is that we encounter him on a daily basis, day after day after day after day must be what we are desiring is, is that encounter with him on a daily basis. And I want to say this. Won't you lift your hands in this house this morning? Far too often we feel that, that breath of God, that little touch in our heart, and we allow that to be enough. And too often we've, ar we've, we've risen from that place with him and said, Understand that God has moved the mark in our lives. Touches are no longer what we can handle and what we need. We need to fully embrace the very presence of God. How many, and I feel led to say this, how many times have you walked into his presence and touched him and said, that's enough. And we get up and we leave him like, I had so much more I wanted to say to you. I feel like this is one of these encounters this morning. God wants to say something so rich. God has so much to say to us this morning. So I implore you today, don't be in a hurry. Don't, don't, don't worry about what the next 25, 30 minutes might hold. God wants to say something in this house this morning. I'm beyond the touch. I'm beyond that little thing that makes me happy. That little voice that that speaks. I need more of that today. How many? How about you? Am I identifying with anybody in this room this morning? I need about it. I need every ounce of His Spirit that I can get in my life today. I am addicted to Jesus. I am addicted to His presence. I'm addicted to His grace. I'm addicted to His mercy. I'm addicted to who He is. I know that I need Him. I've got to have Him. you, I want you to come up here right now. If that's you, come up here right now. Come on, come on, come on. Some of you sit back there. Come on. Come up here. Holy Ghost fire in this house, God. Something that's absolutely unprecedented, an encounter that we've never had at any time in our lives, God. I pray it right now. I pray for healing in this house. Steve, if you're watching me right now, I know we had an encounter together yesterday, but I pray in the name of Jesus. Right now, Father, that you go where we can't go, do what we can't do. And I pray in the name of the Lord that the healing wings of God, as those angels that surround that house right now, I implore the very presence of your, of your spirit, God. I pray right now, healing. Everybody say with me, healing healing right now, oh God. Not only upon the physicality, I pray for the spiritual mind. Let the very mind of Christ be in him right now. Let the healing mind of God, let him get up and walk in it. Let him talk about it. In the name of Jesus, God, I implore your presence right now to go there, surround him, minister to him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Somebody rejoice in that now. Rejoice now, 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 like it's your healing.
I release a prophetic word in this house right now. I release healing in this house right now. I release the grace of Almighty God in this house right now. I come against the spirit of condemnation. Let grace override right now. Bless this house. Bless this house. Bless this house. you this. There's some game changers in this room. You're so tired of sitting on the bench, watching things go, watching them run up and down the court and getting nothing done. You want in the game, but you don't know how to get in the game. And you've allowed, you've allowed fear to keep you on the sideline. And you've watched them go up and down and up and down. How many game changers do we have in this room? Come on, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of that. God's going to put you in the game and you're going to change the atmosphere of your surroundings. Things are going to be different. This is not a cliche statement. Things are going to be different because of the Spirit of God that rests on you. Not just in you, but you carry the Spirit of God. spirit can walk in a room and bring things down, I speak this spirit that you will walk in carrying the very essence and the presence of Almighty God. You will make a difference. that you have yearned for, that that you have sought God for, that mantle, that oil, God's laying it upon you now. There are requirements that come with it. He will take you into the loneliest places of your life, but that's part of the mantle. You will hear his voice and distinguish it from all other voices because Jesus said, my sheep know my 
voice and another they will not follow. That's part of the mantle. You will not walk alone. You will do as Moses did and you will begin to distribute. There are people that are going to rise up in ministry all around you. They're going to get out of their boats and say, I've been tired of sitting where I am. What can I do to enhance the kingdom of God? Not just in this church. You better hear what I'm saying. Because you're not called to this church. You're called to this city. church is healthy. God needs a doctor to go to Winston-Salem and heal the sick and speak a word to those that are without. When this mantle gets to a point in your life that you can't bear it up, you need to understand shared with the one to your left. from them last night and I told them Dylan and I both, I told them I, said, I, don't, I, I don't even know that you equate in, 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 the, in, the, in the times that I've been into this house every single time without fail and I've gone to houses and I've, I couldn't wait to get out of the house simply because, not because of the people but the spirit that was there we live in a society today right now that really doesn't want anything to do with the presence of God oh, they, might, they might sing about him they might even talk about him They've never really been introduced to who he really is. And there's a difference. There's a difference. We want to, we want to run away from scriptures that says, everybody that, not everybody that's going to call on my name shall enter in. We, want to, we don't want to talk about that stuff. But there is a society today that wants nothing to do with the essence of his presence in their life because it's costly. His presence has cost me friends. It has cost me family, but his presence is worth every ounce that he pours upon my life. He said, you think I came to bring peace on this earth? He brought, I brought a sword. I brought division. Not that he wanted to bring it, but he understood that there would be a people that yearned for his passion and his presence, and there would be a people that would not. This is a place that yearns for his presence and his passion and that wants God more than they want their necessary food. So I'm going to tell you this. There were five wise and there were five foolish. And I hope you've, I hope you've seen it like this before. These five wise understood something, that the delay of his coming might be a little bit longer than what they anticipated. So the Bible says they had extra oil. They brought extra. The five foolish brought just enough to get by. Just enough to get by is not going to last us any longer. What are you saying, man? I'm saying you need to buy oil. You need to purchase oil. You need to get on your face. And you need, to, you need to fill your vial. And when that's full, you need to set it aside and get another vial and fill it full of oil so that you're going to have enough to sustain the onslaught that might come against you in this last day. Somebody say yes.
I let it go. Somebody hear you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. Don't you be afraid what other people think about you. <laughs> I sold that car a long time ago. I don't care what you think about me. I care what he thinks about me. <laughs> I care. I made, a, I made a commitment to him alone. Come here, sister. Come, come here. Come here. Yes, you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise. I'm just going to love on you here for a minute. Here. Lift your hands. Notice me, and what you don't realize, God has had his gaze upon you for a very long time. You don't understand what favor looks like. Favor means sometimes very tumultuous times in your life. Favor sometimes means not understanding where you are, but knowing that he's with you. Not understanding why you are where you are, but he is with you. God is pulling some things out. God is, it's like a syringe that's withdrawing blood. God's pulling some things out. Every ounce of impurity, and not that it's wrong and not that it's sin, but he wants you to look so much like him because what he wants to release in your life is far beyond what you've ever thought in you. Father, I put, I release the favor of God. Let her eyes see what, what you have desired to her to see for a very long time. And God, I pray right now that you would release the more in her life. Release the more in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. God, my 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 God, hallelujah, let me wait on God for just a minute, there are a lot of things I can do right now, I want to make sure we do the right thing here, can I have some when I hear that? Travis, you trust me, right? <laughs> okay. God is a very sovereign God. Except when he speaks. And then he's bound to his word. His sovereignty scares me sometimes. It's not an arrogance. It's just he's God. And he just simply does what he wants to do when he wants to do it, right? It's almost as if it's as, it's it's almost as if he can pass right by you because he has and not notice you when he does notice you, but that's his sovereignty. He's just so intent on on what he's going to do. But but when he speaks, when he speaks into your life, all of a sudden the, he becomes bound to what he said. And he cannot vary from what he wants to, what he would like to do. Otherwise, he cannot vary from it because he spoke and he's bound to what he said he would do. I'm saying this for a reason. Hear me. God would have in Noah's day, he was so upset with the generation of time, he'd have just soon wiped out the planet and started over. But he couldn't because he was bound to his word. Remember in, in the third chapter of Genesis, he, he had that conversation with the woman and, and the serpent. And it was the first Messianic prophecy. So humanity could not be wiped off the face of the earth because he was bound to his word. So he had to wait on a Noah. He had to wait on a man before he could bring forth the flood. He had to 
wait on Moses for 450 years. These people stood in bondage and they prayed, deliver us. But God had to wait for a man that was ready to handle what God needed to do to bring a nation out because he's bound to his word. God wants to do something, and I'm going I'm to speak this over this house. And there may be some individuals that, I, that this may target, but God has been waiting. Sit down for just a minute. You can sit on the floor. You can sit wherever you want to sit. I don't care. Stay right where you are. want to lose this. So stay in here. Stay in here. Stay close. I like this. You stay right here. But what Samuels are being raised up right at this very moment in time that love the presence of God. Fifty years, these people lived in bondage. We've been a nation 269, 68. Think of that. America has been a nation for almost half the time, almost half the time that Israel lived in bondage to Egypt. What is your mindset over that period of time? You pass, what do you pass down to every generation over that period of time? We're slaves. We're slaves to fear. We're slaves to bondage. All we know is to make what they tell us to make and do what they tell us to do. And yet, they were branded. They were chosen. They were the people of God. And there they sat for 450 years, waiting. With each generation that would pass, there would be a cry that would come up, save us, God. Bring us out of this mess. We want to be who you've called us to be. Save us, God. Save us, God year after year after year after year to 450 years there was a man out in the desert somewhere that had a call of God on his on his life and he didn't even know it and I say this to this house there's a call on your lives there's a, there, there is a call on this church I'm not tired of saying it every time I come back here I'll say it until God tells me not to say it you're in the midst you're in the middle of nowhere out here by design some of y'all might have scratched your head. Why are we going out? Look, you can be on an iceberg in Alaska, but if the presence of God is in that house and there's something that is changing lives, <laughs> they'll find you. You don't have to worry about necessarily finding them. I was telling Danielle yesterday, she's talking about this beautiful blue siding that's out here on the wall. She doesn't necessarily like that blue siding. But that, but that, that tabernacle in the wilderness was, co was covered with nothing but badger skins. It was, it was the most ugly looking thing you probably could ever look at. But what was on the inside of that? Pure gold. <laughs> I may not look like much to this world, but I have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of his power might be of... You need to quit worrying about what you look like and who you are and what your DNA is and who you've been raised up by and begin to focus about what's inside of you and the gift that God has placed in there. I said you are a difference maker. When you put that between here and here, that I can walk into a room and I can make a difference in somebody's life. I've been doing it for years. I don't mind saying that. I'm not boasting about me. I'm talking about him. I know that I can walk into a room and change the atmosphere. Why? Because God said I could. Because when he walked into a room, everything changed. He put that that was in him, he put it in us. I'm going to hit somebody. Well, you, I feel a little bit 
bit of Smith Wigglesworth in me right now. I got in a, I don't know, I may have told you this. I don't know, this just, I, I don't know. It don't matter. I, 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 I got in my car the other day. I had to run to Walmart. It's been a, a month or two, three, I don't know. And I had gotten up from the presence of God. I'd been on my face. and I don't know how long I'd been there. And, and the... He filled the room. You all know what I'm talking about? I found myself not even breathing because I don't know how long it passed, and I finally went. <gasps> I got up, and I got in the car, and I, I knew I had to run to Walmart, and I had to get about, I had to get about my daily business. So I get in the car, and I'm, I'm, I'm driving across town, and I'm just weeping, and people are passing by me. I got my hand out the window. I'm praying for these folks as they go by. This, I don't know what I'm, I'm just praying. God, let them have an encounter. Let them experience you. And I get into the parking lot, and I can't get out of the car. I'm just, his presence is so strong in the car, and I'm just enjoying him. I get up out of the car over a period of time, and I walk in Walmart. And something I noticed, remember when Moses came down out of the mountain, he didn't look the same as when he walked up in there, right? His whole countenance has changed. Now, my hair wasn't white, and I hadn't aged but something had attached itself to me because when I walked in the store, everybody was looking at me. I mean everybody. I'm talking about the guys and the, and the gals. For, I mean everybody. And I, and, the, and I noticed and I heard the voice of God say, they see you on me and they don't know what it is. You have that ability to carry, to carry it's like the Bible says we slip into a garment. He said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as if you slip into a garment and you carry him everywhere that you go. I'm going to brag on him for just a minute too here. I don't know what we're going to do here in this segment. My God, Father, in the name of Jesus, for the gift that's here. But I want you to understand something. Far more than that gift, he loves you. That's an amazing gift, but he loves you far more than he does the gift. He's not going to take it from you. He just wants you to understand something. You need to get your hands into the ground and cultivate it. Because just when you think you've reached the pinnacle, he will take you back down the mountain. And you've been there. And you've wondered, why am I walking around this mountain? Well, he's trying to show you a path, another path to the top of another mountain that's even higher and more full of what he had given you initially. Father, I put, she has an Elisha spirit upon her. She wants more than what she's had in the past. And the only place you get it is in that, that place on your face before him. And you walk into that closet and you shut the door and you get alone and don't be afraid of the isolation because you might be alone for a very long time. But he wants you alone because there you can entertain his voice and his presence and you can see the things that God has desired for you to see. And be quiet when you walk in there because he wants to talk to you. I speak blessing over this house. I speak the blessing of God over this house. I'm addressing some folks in this room right now that don't understand what I'm talking about. Don't be offended at me. Smile, he'll not know I'm talking to you. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But I implore you, I thought I knew this Jesus. I walked with him for years and years. I preached in churches and thought I knew who he was, and I, had a, I didn't have a clue. I didn't. 
I knew what people said he was, so I listened to them, and I thought, I'm going to follow what everybody else said he is. But I had to come to a point in my life that I had to find him for myself. And I know this may be a soundtrack of what I said to you the last time that I was here, but I just, you know, I have a, I have a job right now in this particular part of my journey of life. I, my mission is this, is to enhance the presence of God around the people of God, to let them know that there is a place beyond any place that they have ever been in their lives. We tend to settle, and I said this earlier, we tend to settle for where we are, and, and we get up from an encounter with God and, and, and don't understand that he wanted to do so much more. And we walk in, and we walk in, and we'll get on our face, and we'll find out where he was here last time. Where he, was he just moved the mark. He's not where he was. You've gotten, you've gotten to a particular point in your life that God is saying to you, look, this isn't any good for you anymore. You've got to go further and further and further and further. I got tired of watching people around me have this, this unique call upon their life and me wanting what they had till I had to do something about it. Does this make any sense to you? I speak blessing over this house. I'm going to share with you something here, and baby, if you would, anytime, I gave her permission. She can come get the mic from me anytime she wants to. She's so full of words. It's, it's sick. I'm going to tell you this, and perhaps it will relate to some of you. About uh, a month ago, we were in, we had a conference at the church and had a, had a gentleman named Darren Begley from Houston come. And uh, I, I had kind of explained to you what we had done with our church. Uh, you, you know, God called us to Kokomo. We were there two years. And uh, I realized what, where we were, Polly, was just we had gone as far as I was going to go in ministry. And I didn't know what to do. God said, this part of your journey's over. I'm going to begin to change things in your life. And uh, so we meet this. I found it long and short of it is this church that was struggling, uh, had a gymnasium, amazing facility. We move in there with them, okay? So we're in the sanctuary. And uh, things are going okay. There's adjustments when you get two congregations of people together. So we have this conference, and Darren, I knew Darren was a man that worked in the gifts, and he would speak word to people. I like to do that, but he, he's at a different level than I am. And they told me about him when he was coming, and I was anticipating, because I was the pastor, and I... You know, you think we come into a place and we're going to give a word because he's the pastor. It has nothing to do with it. I literally listen for the voice of God, and, and that's, that's how we operate. So I told God prior to this conference, I said, I don't need a word from him. I'm good. But I said it with this intent. I don't want a word if it's not from you. I don't want this guy to come into my house, our house, and feel obligated to give me a word because I'm the pastor of the church. I don't want that. So God, I don't want a word if it's not from you. Leave me alone with that. That may sound harsh, but I, I don't want people messing with my head if I don't, I, I want to know what he's got to say, don't you? That's the most important voice in my life. If, I, if anything I ever say to you doesn't bear witness with him, then you discard what I say, period. So I said, I don't want a word. For, th for three nights, heaven and earth met. The place was packed, and uh, we barely had enough chairs, right, baby? We, it was just an amazing worship was off the hook. You know, this is a great platform for me. It really is. I love this long stretch. That's what we're getting ready to build, where I got this long stretch of place I can just roam. He preached, and... and each night he'd call people out, and I was just, yes, you know, fill them, fill them, fill them. Last night, you know, he gets done, and uh, he preaches, and he calls different people up. And I'm just not really thinking about much, and he's giving word to everybody, and he says, he, he's done. You know, he turns it back over to the worship team, and I'm, I'm just like, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. So we get into worshiping, and they're singing this song, I will dance around your throne. If your presence is my home, we're worshiping. And you know that that hits you 
when just the presence of God takes over and just doubles you over and it's not about anybody else but you and him and you're communing with God. Y'all know what that's like. Yeah, you sure you do? I feel this. And he begins to prophesy over me. He prophesied that I was going to get ready. I was, I, I was taking upon me this mantle of Nehemiah. This came out of nowhere. And the great thing about this was she had just been all about Nehemiah the last two weeks prior to this. Why Nehemiah? And he began to speak word over me about what I would begin to encounter. I'm saying this for reasons, so stay with me. I'll be about done here in a minute. He's, he's ministering to me about the mantle of Nehemiah and about learning how to place people. And I felt it. I embraced it. I went home and I started tearing Nehemiah up. I wanted to see who exactly what. I know the story, but I wanted to know about the man. And prophesy over your mantle of Nehemiah. Because you got a house that's built. It's a different mantle. It's a prophetic mantle. It's a prophetic mantle. And not as much to this house as to those that you will encounter. I'm going to be humble when I say this. Don't be afraid of it either. Because I've been scared to death of it many times. Just speak. You know his voice. You're a man of God. Speak. He'll take care of the rest. So, I get home. And I'm in my, our war room, our prayer room, whatever you want to call it. That's what we call it. And I've got my book open, and I'm done reading. And the pages are just, I'm just, I'm just feeling his presence. And I said this, and I'll never forget this the rest of my life. It's the greatest encounter to date that I've ever had in 33 years of walking with God, ever. I said I want to know you in ways that I've never known you. I want you to take me to a place, God, that I've never been before. I want to feel the very breath upon my neck. I want to know without any shadow of a doubt when you speak where I need to go and what I need to do. I was so broken when I prayed this prayer. This was three weeks ago. What happened next, I, I heard, felt the room fill. We have this big, I don't even know what she, she, why she put it in there, but it's this big desk, I guess, for, so these angels of God can sit on. I mean, it's huge. It fills the whole room. You walk into the room and you think, oh, this is a nice desk. I could hear, I sensed the very presence of a host surrounding me. And it was as if they were sitting, and I was, and, and I I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to open my eyes. I wanted to see something, and I did it. I didn't see anything. I didn't have to see anything. I didn't have to. I knew what was taking place. And the voice of God began to speak to me. He said, this place that you occupy. He said, this gym was built 20 years ago to host my presence, not to host basketball games. He said, I want you to take that mantle and I want you to cross the parking lot. And I want you to, I want you to begin to set up church in that building. Now, I wasn't worried about what everybody else was going to say. I knew that I knew that I knew that I had heard from God. When you hear his voice, you don't have to convince anybody of anything. You just walk in the authority of God that is upon your life. And you walk in and you say, thus saith the word of God. I begin to tell the people that had been in that building since 1962. The, church, the gym wasn't there then, but that building had been there since 1962. And it was my job to walk across them and tell them, this is what God said. And this is what he said when he told me. 
He said, when you begin to summon the word to build, he said, people will rally around you. And he said, they will join arms. I said, okay, cool. So I called Pastor Gary. I said, look, man. I called him in my office, and I said, this is what God said. And he just stared at me. I don't like the way people look at me sometimes. You know what you're talking about? You want to tell somebody something, and the way that they stare at you, it will cause you to bring doubt into your mind. But I had a word. And he said, I don't want to go to the bank. I said, either do I. I said, because I have a mandate on my life. I said, from the time that I can remember knowing I was going to be a pastor and we were going to build a church, I didn't want to go to a bank. If Moses came up, this, 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 this was for me, okay? This, this was for me. Moses left the desert, went into Egypt, and what did he have? Anybody? What did, what did he have? What was the only thing he possessed? A stick. Had a stick. What are you going to do with a stick? He had a staff. That was it. But when you, all you've got is a staff, and you, and God, you can change the world and turn your situation upside down. You can turn it upside down. And you don't even need the stick. All you need is the very presence of God in your life. He left Egypt with everything they had. All their riches, all their spoil, they left rich. And I, my intent has been this. I don't want to go to a bank. I don't want to say, I need your money. God, if you called me to do something, give it to me. That's what I wanted. All my life, that's what I want. I didn't want to go to a bank. I told him, I said, I have no desire to go to a bank. We need $100,000. We're going to raise this. How? I don't know. Ask him. It's not my job. You missed that. It's not my job. It's his. So, watch this. We're getting ready to move over. Everybody's on board. Everybody's happy. We're going we're gonna to win our city for God. I know that. There's no, no question in my mind about it. God has given me favor with different people in the city. I know what we're going to do. We're going to watch the city of Kokomo change. Are you going to save every soul in there? No, I'm not stupid. I'm not naive. But we're going to save. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bring people to the kingdom of God who, who God puts in our lives. We're going to get out of our building. We're going to infiltrate the city. We're going to do all these great things. We're going to be happy. And, da, da, da. and it's not going to be that easy. Because let me tell you the other side of the coin, where we are right now. Because as good as I can make this sound, and I can make it really sound good, I've never in my whole life, when God places a mantle on you, this is why I told you this, and I, 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 I felt this as we were sitting together last night. When God places a task in your life, you better be ready to fight hell. Y'all believe in spiritual warfare? <laughs> Can I get a witness? Is there something that y'all believe in spiritual warfare? You ever, you ever been in a, buy, in a fight for your life? I mean, for your life, where you didn't think you were going to make it. More times than I can remember. But here I am, and here you are. And if he brought you through that, some of y'all should have been dead. Should have had your funeral a long time ago. Whoop, but here you are. He brought you up, brought you out, so you could be a difference. Say, here I am. Now what? So, can I just tell you the ugly side of it and I'll be done? Oh, sure. You don't want to hear the ugly. You want to hear the ugly? You want to hear about ugly church? How many want to hear about ugly church? Oh, I know you do. I got your interest now. Tell us the ugly, Pastor. I want to hear the ugly. Here's the ugly. Right now, I've got, I've got, I've got a meeting set up Tuesday night at 630. So you pray for me. I've got I've got some men in my in my life in our ministry that are pulling in all different directions. We're fighting unity right now. Oh, we're all we're all for going across the way. 
Don't get me wrong. But God has put different men in my life that have DNA, that have DNA from other ministries. They've been told this all their life, and they've been told that all their life. This is the way they're going to do things, and that turns the way. And, and, you know, I find some of them here in our midst, and they want to bring their knowledge and their understanding to our table and say, we, ought to th- we think this and this and this. That's the importance of these young men laying on this altar that we raise up sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. You put your word in them. You put your spirit in them. Let me tell you about young people. I'm, I don't mean to take so long. Let me tell you something about young people. Jesus held babies, held children in his arms. He said, this is the kingdom of God right here. If we build everything for us, adults, and we let our kids go by the wayside, uh, I doubt that you're going to have the blessing of God upon your life too long. Because as much as it is about us, it's just as much about them because I understand this my ministry right now has me linked to such a younger generation when your former pastor Bob used to come to my dad's house I'd go sit at his feet I was just a young man but I wanted to know all about Bob Williams I wanted to know I wanted to know all about the men that he had put into ministry I wanted to hear about the camp meetings I wanted to hear what it And I got more out of his problems than I did his blessings because I knew someday I was going to face my old problems. And I wanted to know how I was going to get from here to there. And I wanted to glean a little bit of wisdom from the generation in front of me. Every time Dad brought somebody older, I'd be the one to pick him up. And my mom would get mad at me sometimes because why are you being so nosy? Nosy had nothing to do with it. I want to know about these men's lives. They thought they'd sneak out somewhere. They'd tell me they weren't having to. That, I'd find them. I'd find them. i find I want to know, man. I wanted to glean. I wanted to glean. Yeah, I was waiting on that voice. Listen to me. I had a vision the other day. There's this individual, and when I heard you say, yeah, this man's crazy. God is crazy. He's crazy how he works. Say crazy. No, crazy. There he goes. That's that's the southern African American in you. Crazy. Crazy. Wish I had crazy. I was sitting there and he had grapes. And there's this big tree. This individual's taking one grape at a time. Squeeze. Squeeze. That's the pouring out process long that took to fill that jar. I remember sitting there, and I didn't sit there as long as it took to fill, but squeeze, 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 squeeze. You didn't get to where you are right now overnight. There's been a gleaning process in your life. Like Ruth in the fields of Boaz, you've been picking things up, and God has left things in your path for you, and you didn't even know it was him. And you picked it up and you put it on and you put it. But your gleaning season for this part of your season is over. And you've, you've entered into this brand new pouring out process. You've taken in and taken in and taken in. And God is so favorable with your, your heart and how that you've taken in. He's found favor with you. But the pouring out is beginning now. And I want to challenge you to do something. Don't stay where you are. You keep your eyes on the generation behind you because there are young singers and worship leaders and artists that are behind you that's going to be gleaning from what you have. And not only to the group in front of you, but you've got to turn around throughout your life and begin to pour in because they want to do it like you do it because you do it like he does it. Does that make sense to you? That's what's so awesome about this house is because there's so many young people, there's so many elderly people, and there's so many in-betweens. That is the statue of heaven. Where, where was I at? Now I forget. What was I talking about? Oh, uh, 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 the ugly. We're getting ready. Mary and our, our uh, other campus is getting ready to build a multi-million dollar wing facility for nothing but young people. Pastor uh, Pastor Robbie came and said, "Look," she said, "If we're going to be, if we're all about young people, she said we don't have room for our young people. 
And she said, I don't think God's going to bless us if we don't. I mean, what are you going to say to that? Build. So they're building a, a I say, multi-million, million and a half dollar facility onto the wing that they have at our Marion campus. But nothing but kids. Kids. They understand the process of, we said it last night, folks. Elijah had an Elisha. Moses had a Aaron. Well, he also had a Joshua. There's always going to be, there always has to be somebody to pass this on to. So we've got this meeting with these guys that are just got different directions. And I'm sitting there thinking, I got a, I got a text yesterday. We're in the mall. And uh, you, you all know the Haynes Apperson, Haynes Apperson, Haynes Mall. Is that what it's called? I was on the second tier. And I was, when I got the text, I was on that ledge, you know, leaning over. I wanted to jump over the ledge. <laughs> Oh, come on. Yeah, like you ain't never been there before. <laughs> like you ain't never felt the, the mantle and the weight of pressure in your life. You're thinking, how much more am I going to be able to take? And that's the problem. We're trying to take all this in. And my wife began to speak word to me. And I knew she was right, but I didn't want to hear it. But I listened, and it helped. And it was a salve. He said, my, my yoke is easy, and my burden is but we want to carry the burden. We want to be so weighted down. Because why? We think if we don't get the job done, if we don't handle this situation, it'll never get done. we got to say, God, I cannot do this. And that qualifies you for doing it, that you can't do it, and you understand it, and you give it to him and say, do it for me, God. Build this house. Say it. Build this house. I can't do it. You can. I can walk as a vessel obedient to the call and the will of God. I can plant. I can sow. Woo! But he's got to be the one that's going to bring the increase. You believe he will? You precious angel of God. You are a precious angel of God. Hallelujah. Raise your hand. Oh, that little shyness is about you. Shy people scare me. Because locked inside of every one of them is this, oh, this lion. Look at me going, I'm serious. There's a lion in here. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And you know what? You got the lamb and the lion. You're a combination you got the meekness of a lamb, but don't back this girl into a corner. Father, in the name of Jesus, let her understand this. Let her understand the lion that's inside, the warrior, the roar, the roar. I pray, God, that she, what's your name? Alicia will fall in love with you in ways that she never has before. Mark her life. Mark her, Lord. She's part of another generation that is rising up, God. You're going to do exploits and don't be afraid of that. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You agree with that? Yes. Amen. Praise God. So, we'll finish ugly. I got all these different people going in different directions, having their own ideas. And they're all wanting my attention and they want me to listen to what they think needs to be done. Go, let's do this. We need to do that. I got a text last night. God told me to go in on Easter and start this church. Well, our, we don't have chairs. Anybody want to buy a chair at my church? We. We don't have our stage yet. There's so much stuff that has to be done. But God said Easter. This guy, this knucklehead texted me last night and says, Pastor Brad, he's a knucklehead. I love him. He's my brother. We're linked arm in arm. I call him a knucklehead all the time. So I'm not talking about him. I'll call him a knucklehead when I get home. Do he say? He's a knucklehead sometimes. I'm a knucklehead sometimes. You're a knucklehead. <laughs> That's humility when you can agree to it. He said, maybe we ought to wait on Mother's Day. Oh, right. Okay, sorry, God, so-and-so said we need to wait. We don't trust you. 
We don't trust that we're going to have enough chairs and a stage. And here is the point that I'm trying to make. When it becomes about, oh, what it looks like, this is beautiful. But if it's about the decor and not his presence, then you're going to lose everything. What's the premium? I felt a power of his spirit in this house, Travis, up here. Maybe when you call these people to the front, I felt the pre- you feel the power in unity like that? When you, get a, when you get hungry people together, oh, my God. Hungry people are healthy people, right? <laughs> right? It's when you don't eat, you become unhealthy. And the more you don't eat about him, the more you stay away from his presence, the more you don't get in his word, the more you avoid his spirit, the more, avoid you, the more you avoid doing what God has called you to do, you become one starved, unhealthy individual. I'm telling you, eat. You get everything. Eat. Eat the word. Eat the song. Eat the spirit. Absorb. Get it all. He told those people in the wilderness, he said, man is going to fall, but you need to get it when it falls because when the sun comes up, it's going to melt and it's not going to be there later. And you can't gather enough for tomorrow and sleep in that day. What's he saying? He said, you got to get me every single day. So my last thing, I, this is my third closing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 33rd chapter of Exodus, God calls Moses and he says, hey Moses, he said, go ahead and, I love how he says it, he says, go ahead and go on over, he said, go go to that land that flows with milk and honey, he says, go, and he said, and take these people that you brought up out of Israel, out of Egypt with you, take them with you, go. He said, I'm going to send an angel with you, and I'll drive out all the Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and every ite that's over there. Go, but I'm not going with you. He says, this, this is a stiff-necked generation. They won't trust me for anything. He says, I'm not going. Take them. I'll send an angel, but I'm not going with you. That struck the heart of Moses. Because Moses, from the time that he left that desert till he entered into Egypt, he knew that he wouldn't make it without God. And he knew that, yeah, we could go in and possess the land. We could walk into Canaan and and there'd be milk and honey and, and we could have all the good things, but we wouldn't have him. Can I say this? And I hope this isn't offensive. We had a snow out day the other day at church. It, we had like, they said we were going to have two inches of dusting. And it was as if heaven opened and all the white stuff that was up there came down and just never stopped. I got to church two hours early just wondering what was going to happen, waiting for it to stop. And one lady got a, a, one of the people I called. They said, well, the radar says it stopped an hour ago. I said, well, the radar's a liar because it's coming down harder right now than I've seen it all winter long. And it just kept coming and coming. And it finally got to a point I said, we can't, there's no way. You know, the plow guy was out there, and he plowed our parking lot and needed to plow it all over again by the time he got done. Thank God for North Carolina, huh? So we canceled. And uh, I left the church. I was heading home, and I thought, I wonder if anybody else is having church in the city. And I went to the mega church across town, the country club is what I call it. Yeah, well, that's right. I know that sounds horrible. God loves those folks, but it's the place to be. If you got money and you have, you, you have an affluency in, in the city and you want to rub shoulders with the right people, you go to this place. And they've got all the great musicians and good singers and they got lights and it's strobing and they got couches, leather couches for you to sit on. You can kick back and have your latte like this and listen to them to sing about God. Notice I said sing about God. And I walked in and they, they didn't have a full crowd because of the snow, but I walked in the house, Jesse, and there was probably about, I don't know, four or five, six hundred people there. And it was and the guys they were up there just he had a hat on and he was all this 
having a good time. And I thought this is exactly what went through my mind. They were singing songs that we sing, but this is exactly what, what went through my mind. If I was Satan, this wouldn't scare me at all. And that's the truth. Does that sound horrible? Are there places like that? You better know it. Remember when Zacharias was in the temple? He went in to do his daily business, you know? The Bible says an angel of the Lord showed up, and it freaked him out. Half these churches, if, if the presence of God showed up in that place, it'd freak them out. Half of them wouldn't come back. I'm not going to do that stuff. I'm not going to get happy and sing about it. Sing to me. Entertain me. I'll tip the ushers. He goes by. Let me go home and get my little taste. God is looking for a people today that will get into his presence, seek him, desire him, want him more than they want anything else. And it is there that he begins to pour out his presence. So I told our church, you can come to the musician. Well, they're already up here. Travis, come up here and get ready. <laughs> I said, we'll, we can move across the way. And it could be all about everything else, but we're taking him with us. I don't care what the building looks like. I really don't. I want it to be nice, but I want him to be the niceness about it. Don't you? Isn't that what you want for your life? For who you are? Stand with me this morning. Hey, when it's all about you, that's what my heart for let it be about you let it be about you may my life be about you may my life be about you Father, I bless this house. I thank you for this beautiful church. I thank you for the leadership of this church. I thank you for my precious friend, Danielle and Travis, Lord. I thank you for the call of God that is upon their life. As he walks, help him to carry the very presence, that presence of God, help him to carry it. Not just inside, but outside. This whole body of believers, God, that that they have yearned for, desired, and been afraid to step out for, I release it, Lord, again in the spirit right now. Right now. Right now. I pray that they can't even rest, God, until they walk into your presence on a daily basis. Let it be about you. Say something to my friend for I Steve, I don't know if you're asleep or if you're listening. I was honored to come down and pray with you. I'm going to speak the word again into you. You will live and not die, and you will declare the works of the Lord. You will live and not die and declare the marvelous works of the Lord. Come on, one more time. You will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Shout it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Let's just, let's just come up here one more time. If you want to, I'm not going to force you to. Just come on up here one more time.
more time. I want to do it like this. Hallelujah. Deep calleth unto deep. There is a depth, Lord God, that we desire in this house. Send us into this city, into its suburbs, into the low places, the high places, the mid-class places, God. Send us armed with a word in your spirit, oh God. We are an army. We are an army of many generations that carry the mantle of your presence in our life, oh God. We will live and not die. We will declare your works. Hallelujah. Hey. Let's just give God one more shout of praise this morning as we close this service today. How many have felt the presence of God in this room this morning? Come on, let's just lift up one shout of victory. Let's give God one good thank you this morning. Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your glory in this place. We bless you, King Jesus. We honor you this morning. Come on, one more time before we leave. The Bible says clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. He's worthy, worthy, worthy. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Real quickly, before, before you go home, before you're dismissed, I want to ask um, a couple ushers to uh, come up front with some baskets we're going to receive offering this morning, and um, as they're doing that, I want to tell you, some of y'all, a lot of y'all are probably wondering why Brad is is here uh, this morning. Um, back in November, when Brad was here last, um, we had an incredible, incredible men's fellowship meeting um, on a Saturday morning. Brad ministered. Uh, Lucas ministered, and we just had a great time in the Lord. And uh, Brother Steve Marler was here and actually invited Brad to um, come back to his home. And Steve showed him some of his motorcycles and all that good stuff. Brad uh, has this desire to be a Harley guy, although from what I found out yesterday, he probably shouldn't be. But um, so him and Steve really hit it off well. And, and um, about seven weeks ago, actually, uh, I, when, when Steve was, was getting really sick, I, I text Brad and just asked him to pray. Pray for Steve, you know, have your church pray. Just wanted as many people praying as we could possibly have praying. And, and uh, he immediately texted me back and said, do you think Steve would mind if I came and, and prayed with him? I said, of course, he, he wouldn't mind. But I wanted to make sure that he knew that I, I wasn't, wanting to make him feel obligated to come. I just wanted him to pray. And and for about seven weeks now, him and Della have been trying to get here every weekend. They, they've been snowed in several times. Uh, two weeks ago, it was negative four uh, degrees in Kokomo, Indiana. Brad and Della are not just a hop and a skip away. They live in Kokomo, Indiana. Um, but Brad wanted to come and pray with Steve. And, and I think that he, he didn't want to come preach. That, that wasn't his motive. I told him, if you're going to be here, you're, you're going to preach. And he said, well, that's not why I want to come. He said, I just want to pray with Steve. And uh, so we went over there yesterday and we prayed for him and had a good time. And, and uh, Brad come because he wanted to pray with Steve, but also because he knows what Steve means to me. And he knows what Steve means to this church. And that's why he wanted to come and, and pray with Steve. And, and I believe with, with what happened yesterday in Steve's home, and, and I believe with what's happened here today in this service, I, I believe things are changing. Some, something's happening. Something's changing. Something's moving. And I just declare that this morning. And, um, you know, every time Brad comes, I feel like I enjoy his company 
uh, more than the time before. And uh, I'm so glad he brought his precious wife, Della, with him. Such a beautiful woman of God, and we enjoy her company every time we're, we're with her. And uh, Brad, I told the congregation a couple months ago, I told them that you are my Zachariah. And I don't know if, you know, I, I, I remember mentioning this story about Zerubbabel. And I don't know what you're, you going to preach on that? Okay, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. This is what I told the congregation. I said, I feel like you're my Zechariah because Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah. And he went to build the temple, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And every time the weight of ministry got heavy and every time he felt overwhelmed or that he didn't have enough resources to get the job done, God would send Zechariah into Zerubbabel's life and he would minister to him and he would encourage him. And it was Zechariah who told Zerubbabel that it's not by might nor by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord that this is going to happen. And every time, you know, I don't know what it is about this relationship. I just know it's a God thing. I share things with this man that I can't I can't share with anybody else on the face of this earth. And 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 he is just such an I I feel guilty sometimes because I am such a recipient of him and he just every time he comes here he pours into me and Danielle and every time he leaves we're just we just feel so encouraged. And so Brad, thank you for coming this weekend. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the burden that you share with this church and so just lift your hands right now towards Brad, and let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak strength right now, God. I know that him and Della are stretched on every side right now. I know that they work full time. I know that they're in ministry, Lord God, and I know that they're in a, a, a big building project right now. And so, Father, we ask for safe travel this afternoon as they head home. And, God, we just ask for unity in their church right now, God. We speak blessings over their house, God, over their home, over their church in the name of Jesus. And, Father, we just ask right now for an unexplainable, supernatural strength to come upon them over the next few weeks. God, we pray, God, that Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, there would just be a mighty move of your presence in that place, God. Give them your favor. Give them your grace and mercy. And we declare this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Roger's got a basket. Jarrett's got a basket. Before you leave, would you just drop an offering? We want to send Brad away blessed in Jesus' name. After you drop your offering in, have a few moments of fellowship, and uh, you're dismissed today in Jesus' name. Please check your bulletins. All the announcements are in the bulletins. Please check those so you know what's going on in the next few weeks here at Spirit of Truth. Have a blessed day in Jesus. Praise God. Real quick, before you leave, before you leave, can I have everyone's attention real fast before you leave? How many still believe in the miracle working power of Jesus Christ? Come, how many believe in the miracle working power of Jesus Christ? How many remember that we've been praying for a long time for, for a little baby boy by the name of Hudson? Hudson Bond, my, my cousin's son, he, he was born... And uh, they took him home, and about a week later, he started having breathing problems, some issues. They took him to the hospital, found out something was bad wrong with his heart. Long story short, he, he was in and out of the hospital, in and out of the hospital, had to have a heart transplant. Several times it looked like he wasn't going to make it. It felt like he wasn't going to make it. But he is here in service with us this morning. He is doing fine and well in Jesus' name. And that is a credit to the miracle working power of Jesus Christ. Let's give God a great praise. Praise the Lord. God bless you this morning. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.